On today's episode, Starship could be launching tomorrow, Russia and China have a nuclear plan for the moon, NASA's new AI exploration team, and the Navy tests Artemis II recovery by flooding their ship. This is the Space Race. The head of Russia's Roscosmos Space Agency has announced that both Russia and China are considering a joint mission to construct a nuclear power facility on the moon. On March 5th, Yuri Borisov reported that the two countries had been working on a lunar program that would see Russia's expertise on nuclear space energy hitch a ride on China's lunar program in order to hopefully create strong power infrastructure for a lunar settlement. Borisov said that today we are seriously considering a project somewhere at the turn of 2033 to 2035 to deliver and install a power unit on the lunar surface together with our Chinese colleagues. His argument here being that solar power, even in a location without atmospheric interference, would not be enough to provide the power needed for a successful settlement. Now he's not wrong here, Solar power does work much better on the moon, but with a 14-day night cycle, we'd have to transport a lot of heavy batteries to store the energy to survive the extreme cold. But it wasn't just a power plant that Borisov mentioned. He also spoke about a nuclear-powered cargo spaceship. Borislav said that Roscosmos is working on a cyclopean structure, referring here to a vehicle of tremendous size, that could do anything from ferry material between different orbits to collecting space debris, all powered by a nuclear reactor. Using nuclear power in space isn't new. NASA and its partners have been using radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs, to power things like the Cassini probe since it was invented in 1954. But the RTG is more like a battery, and the difficulty with any sort of nuclear power in space is that a lot of heat is generated. Heat is usually transferred away from a generator by the air around it, but obviously in space, that's not an option. Long deployable radiators could be used, but without testing, it's hard to know how viable that would be on an active nuclear reactor. For his part, Borisov mentioned that heat dissipation is really the only technical hurdle left to solve before beginning orbital tests and construction itself. The big question is, how likely is this to happen? Roscosmos hasn't exactly been on their A-game lately. Their first moon mission in 47 years slammed the Luna 25 lander into the surface rather than deploying properly, and the country's war with the Ukraine has lost its several international partners. That being said, if they are working with the Chinese to get this done, there could be some hope for this plan. The Chinese space agency, CNSA, has grown steadily over the last few years, not just in launch capabilities, but also in terms of their own projects like the Tiangong Space Station, which the CNSA launched and constructed inside just 18 months. Just last month, China announced that they were going to attempt to put a Chinese astronaut on the moon before 2030, so their sights are firmly set on lunar development. Regardless, this program is still on very shaky ground. It's going to take a few more years to even figure out if Russia and China want to buckle down and cooperate on this thing, let alone start actual construction. And with the date range being in the mid-2030s, it'll be a while before NASA needs to turn focus away from their own lunar program. The next Starship test flight will take place on March 14th, pending FAA approval. That is the latest, according to posts from the SpaceX social media account on March 6th. The company has been working steadily on preparing their next test vehicle for flight since the explosive finale of Integrated Flight Test 2, the last mission that saw a fairly successful deployment of their prototype Starship Super Heavy rocket back in November 2023. In fact, the FAA just recently closed the mishap report into the destruction of both the Super Heavy booster and Starship vehicles on February 26th, which is a good indication that the next launch license is not too far from being handed out. On March 3rd, SpaceX completed a full wet dress rehearsal, filling their stacked Starship with fuel as though it was actually going to fly before draining it again. And then reports came in that the flight termination system, which destroys the vehicle should something go terribly wrong with its flight path, was installed barely a week later on March 9th. The FTS can only be certified for a few days at a time, so 
Clearly, SpaceX believes that permission to go ahead with IFT-3 is close. And seeing as how we know from the last test flight that the company works very closely with the FAA during these investigation and certification periods, it's almost certainly the case that SpaceX was told to expect their launch license by around March 14th. The company hasn't nailed down a specific launch time yet, that's likely because they still haven't received a firm answer on the date. Should permission be granted on time, however, this will be the fastest turnaround time between test launch vehicles in the company's history, with just under four months between flights. IFT-3 is reportedly going to continue the SpaceX playbook by testing a new series of milestones and will therefore be taking a slightly modified flight path to the one that had IFT-2 splashing down off the coast of Hawaii. This flight is planning on spending some time in orbit testing a Raptor engine relight and boost maneuver, which should have the vehicle splashing down in the Indian Ocean instead. It will also be opening up its payload doors during the coasting phase of the flight around 12 minutes in, even though it won't have any cargo again this time. And the last major milestone SpaceX is aiming for during this test is the cryogenic fuel transfer from a header tank to the main tank of Starship during the flight. This will be the first real-world experiment that will hopefully lead to a ship-to-ship -ship fuel transfer in orbit, a huge requirement that NASA needs to see from Starship before allowing it to fly Artemis 3 in 2026. But it's clear that SpaceX is confident. IFT-2 very nearly made it to orbit, and the company has already fixed the issues that caused the blockage in Booster 9's liquid oxygen filter and the leaks which caused internal fires in Ship 25 during the fuel purge event. Starbase upgrades have been coming along well. The new tank farm upgrades that the Starbase crew had spent the last two or more months installing allowed all 4,600 metric tons of fuel to be loaded in just under 40 minutes during the wet dress rehearsal, which is just an insane feat of engineering. SpaceX is ready for this flight. All that's left is the FAA's nod. NASA is continuing their rapid-fire production of lunar rovers, this time announcing that their trio of suitcase-sized robots called Cadre have finished testing and are about to be shipped out to the folks at Intuitive Machines to be loaded onto a Nova Sea lander. Cooperative Autonomous Distributed Robotic Exploration is a team of solar-powered robots that have been designed for the very specific purpose of testing AI exploration, making extensive use of a learning algorithm to help deal with unforeseeable conditions faster than a ground team can react. On the hardware side, these three rovers are only intended to last one lunar day or 14 Earth days and will be equipped with mapping tools and ground penetrating radar, but this equipment is really only there so the folks at Jet Propulsion Laboratory can test for how well the team of robots can complete tasks together. And so while the hardware testing was nerve-wracking, the JPL team have been reportedly more nervous about how their AI will handle the lunar environment. To quote JPL's autonomy lead Jean-Pierre Delacroix, we are going to a unique environment on the moon and there will of course be some unknowns. We've done our best to prepare for those by testing software and hardware together in various situations. So while Cadre's physical testing involved the standard shake and bake treatment, where the rovers were strapped onto a shaker table in JPL's thermal vacuum chamber and treated to extremes of both temperature and physical vibrations, the team also put the software through its paces in different lighting conditions as well as soil consistencies to see how well they dealt with pathfinding when things got rough. The Cadre team has been working around the clock for months to get their tech demonstration in working order, and it seems to have paid off with a clean bill of health. The next step is for the trio to be sent to the Intuitive Machines factory where they will be loaded onto one of their Nova Sea landers, the same type as Odysseus from the recent IM-1 mission that made a less than perfect landing. But don't worry too much, Cadre isn't leaving on the very next boat. The trio is scheduled for the 2025 IM-3 mission, which is targeting the lunar swirls in the Rainer Gamma region and should give more than enough time for Intuitive Machines to work the kinks out. As we start sending robots further and further away from the Earth, the ability for them to automatically solve problems and complete their missions will become necessary to overcome signal lag. Missions like Cadre may not be intended to be more than a tech demo, 
but the lessons learned here will be crucial to building the next generation of rovers. In preparation for next year's Artemis II crewed flight to the moon, the Department of Defense and NASA decided to complete some tests of new equipment and procedures for recovering the Orion capsule after it splashes down in the ocean. According to NASA, the test was made just off the San Diego coast and involved the actual Artemis II crew members for authenticity. This test took place on February 22nd, although the results weren't publicly mentioned until just last week. Sea recoveries are tricky. NASA has a tight two-hour window for the safe recovery of both the crew and the capsule itself, and so recovery teams have to act very fast. And here is where the Navy decided to try a new idea, an amphibious ship. In this case, the USS San Diego was used. The San Diego is an amphibious transport dock with a huge part of its aft section given over to a floodable bay that can be used to scoop up smaller boats or in this case, a space capsule. The test itself involved Navy divers approaching the Orion on faster boats and attaching a winch line to it. The San Diego was then able to pull the capsule into its flooded compartment, seal back up and drain the section, leading to a much safer exit for the astronauts. Daytime and nighttime scenarios were undertaken and everything went very well according to the Navy. In the past, spaceship recovery for missions like Gemini and Apollo involved those Navy divers pulling the astronauts out of their pod and into the ocean, then winching them onto helicopters. This was a much more dangerous procedure, especially because the crew would normally be very weak after spending some time in microgravity, but also because the capsule would have to be winched onto the deck of a waiting ship after the crew were safe, risking the loss of mission data if the helicopter crews weren't fast enough. With this new method, the pod is simply pulled into the flooded dock and then is safely aboard without any other complicated procedures. This isn't a very new idea either. The Navy and NASA have been preparing to use vessels like the San Diego for Artemis crew recovery missions since about 2013 or so. And the Navy dive teams that took part in this test have reportedly been training in NASA's neutral buoyancy lab to ensure a smooth test. But now that we're getting closer to the 2025 launch, testing the whole team together with real hardware was something both agencies were eager to complete. And the success of this test is one more thing to tick on the Artemis II launch checklist.